So like, let's say for example, um, you know, you're a really good guy, right? And you, you do things that are considered good, right? Uh, how would you be rewarded for doing that good? I think the idea of good, right and wrong are probably a little bit different. Um, it would be only that there's the concept of karma, but it's not like a cosmic justice machine. Karma is a, is a Sanskrit word. It just means action, it means doing. So it basically means you're doing it. So when you say you have bad karma or good karma, it's like, well, you're you're doing it. So you've only got yourself to blame. Mm -hmm. So um, let's say somebody was really, really good, like you're a really good guy, right? And if you were to reincarnate, right, just going along with that construct, mm -hmm what would your would your reincarnation be of like a greater status than your current one or would it be of a lesser status now that can that can yeah be, yeah the, the, you know what I'm yeah saying? The, yeah in that sense um there aren't people who are better or worse but mm -hmm. there are worse situations to be in the world this isn't my position but the position of these people would be that as a human being you're in the middle position you're you're in you're able to actually escape the wheel of samsara you know you, you're able to become enlightened because the animals are too stupid the um uh there are people in the hell realms who are, who are too desirous and then and the gods are too happy so they don't care so that those are the positions but these are positions of of yourself in your own life you know when you're in pain you don't care about anything else apart from the pain you know if you're being you being idiotic, you don't care. If you're too happy, you're not bothered. Mm -hmm. So it's about taking the middle position, the middle way. But what's the conclusion, no matter what position you take up? Like, is the conclusion just an infinite chain of reincarnation and an elevation and de like an, uh, uh, you know, uh, de-escalation of status? Or what is the, what's the end game? The end game would be to escape what's called samsara, which is the wheel of existence. So you'll be hoping to leave this world and enter into Nirvana, which which isn't like heaven. It's kind of just not being on the wheel. But I would I would consider that just to be um, you know a, a state of consciousness. I see. And that wheel of existence, if you're trying to escape it, are you trying to escape it into a form of non-existence? Almost, but not quite. Why? <laughs> We're coming to what's up bud i'm good thanks how are you i'm doing pretty good man how are you, Did you say happy ramadan hey yeah thanks man it's coming along all right you know yeah how are you enjoying your fasting you know truth be told man it's um it's challenging this time around but uh there's some good reward in it you know god willing there's some good reward in it for me man i think uh it's as long as i'm keeping busy it's not really like too bad you know but it's like the times of stagnation then all of a sudden like today i was super thirsty man super 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 thirsty and i think it was like the first day that i was actually feeling dehydration i was mm -hmm. out running around and in the sun and all that stuff so yeah. are you in the u.s yeah yeah whereabouts i can't tell you oh, <laughs> that's no disrespect yeah, it's, temperature a wise. <laughs> it's a really hot place where i'm at <laughs> oh, no. i used to live in palm springs i was there for about six months that is a hotter spot <laughs> that is a much 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 hotter spot man yeah i enjoyed it though i like the desert oh yeah and a lot of friendly community big retirement community there yeah i was actually house sitting for a, a family friend of ours who's um who's quite elderly so yeah, yeah. There's, there's lots of older people yeah yeah, it was fun though. Yeah, I imagine that's the hardest part is the, is the thirst. Uh, you're not really hungry after no, a day. You know, I start with a, uh, I just start with like some oatmeal and some fruits in the morning and stuff and a couple dates and it holds me over, man. It's not, you know, I'm not keeling over by any means as far as the hunger goes and I could suppress that. But, and when you get thirsty and your lips are dry and you're just like, you know, it's like, well, <laughs> Yeah, that's that's going to be the hard part. You know, yeah, I've done water fasts before, where you haven't eaten for like you know ten days, but you you drink water and that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that that's that's when you kind of realize, oh, there's a different kind of hunger. 
<laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. You'll turn rabid. <laughs> You'll turn rabid real quick. Mm. But what's up? What's on your mind, man? How's uh, your reflections going and stuff? I know we had you up on the, the panel some time ago. And uh, what's new? What Any new developments? Any type of insights? or? Mm, no, not really. Um, I just thought I, I wanted to have a chat with you, really. Because you said you, you used to be an atheist. Mm-hmm. How did you come to belief? Well, uh, you want the long version or the short version? I'll try to give you something in between. So okay, beautiful. so basically what happened was I came to a point in my life that prompted me to have some like deep reflection as to what is what is my whole purpose here, okay? And um, there was a spiritual component to that because I couldn't, figure out where consciousness came from. I couldn't figure out like the the things that I've read as far as like the origin of the universe and stuff. It really wasn't satisfying me. So then what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to try to set my ego aside. I'm going to try to uh, eliminate my biases, like my social conditioning, everything that I was kind of exposed to. And I really want to try to do my best to look at this from like a clean perspective, like a clean slate. And then I said, okay, we're going to categorize this stuff. And there's the category of like pure blind faith. Then there's like a blend. And then there's just like strictly science. Right. And when I started approaching the strictly science thing, I realized that there's no way for me to empirically test the claims that are being made. It's not like I had like a a microscopic lab that could now do blah, 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 you know, heading down in that route. And I realized that really what I was doing was just intentionally set, selling myself to the data of what was available and just filling the blank with faith. So I was saying like, hey, you know, we've got all the, all these datums and this looks good and it sounds good, meaning like the whole theory of evolution type thing and mm. um some origins of like how this came to be type thing, whether it be like a multiverse thing or whether it be just like this perpetual dissension of like, you know, an infinite regress type thing. And I was like, you know, all these things could be possible and um, they sound cool. And I was really into like Star Wars films at the time and like always kind of looking out, you know, then I said, okay, it's a closed system. So there has to be a necessary cause for a closed system right? Like the rules, the laws, everything, the order that I see, there has to be some type of a necessary cause. And then I said, all right, what if it's like aliens, you know, like that guy from the history channel, it's got his hair all crazy. Right. And I said, all right, but even these guys, if they're part of the closed system, they'd be bound by space time. They'd have a beginning, they'd have an end. Okay. And then if, if so, they would have communicated with us to some capacity one way or another, and they would have made the purpose recognizable. So that was on the scientific end slash speculation end, but not hyper-skeptic side. Then came the religious end, which was, okay, damn the science. Um, You have to take a look at scripture, try to remain as objective as possible, meaning like don't take a look at people, don't take a look at their actions, um, any type of anything that can be like a microcosm of society, don't, don't do that. So I mean like, groups, right? Um, Movements, don't take a look at that. Rather, just stick to an objective view of the scripture and see what it says, okay? So then I said, okay, if there's any contradictions, if there's any mistakes, if there's any lack of preservation, if there's any um, uh, unfulfilled prophecies, if there's any uh, like egregious errors, okay, then you would have to explore deeper as to what actually happened and why would whatever entity we have contact with from a religious standpoint allow for something like that to happen would the level would the test be fair would there be a level playing field you know what i mean Mm -hmm. then the blended approach was see what agrees with both meaning there's an encouragement or there should be an encouragement in religion to seek knowledge, to study, to explore what you can empirically test both within and outside of yourself. Um, Don't completely disregard logic and reason. 
I'm talking like super basic stuff. You know, last time you're asking for like um, what logical system are you using? And the thing that I wanted to tell you is just basic deductive and inductive reasoning. You know, nothing too heavily philosophical because although I really appreciate philosophy, I found that you just keep digging into like various rabbit holes and it's just a bunch of unanswered questions. And to me, like I'm about getting to a conclusion, you know? Yeah, philosophy is not for you then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 like I love it. I appreciate it in part, but to me, like, by the way, man, you know, uh, I straight up thought that was a Zoom background, dude. You just pulled some some you know crazy mm -hmm. stuff right now by reaching back in that Zoom Zoom background and pulling a blanket out of thin air. So I don't know if anybody else found that. Oh yeah, this <laughs> is cool, this man. is my this is my good office you, in my man. garden. <laughs> oh, good for you, good for you. So, um, you know, I I appreciate philosophy, but uh, it comes with its own kind of restrictions and it comes with its own dead ends. So then uh, finally, after looking at scriptures categorically, like I set standards for myself and I said, look, um, if there is this uncaused cause and if there is this necessary form of existence, it would have communicated with us. It would have sent us some type of guidance or some type of um, message and it would have sent us some type of messenger to deliver that message. And that message had to have been preserved and it had to have given us uh, ways to test it, right? So, and, and it can't categorically have conflicts. So it can't be like, oh, there's two gods or three gods or a hundred gods, um, because you wouldn't know which one of those is talking to you. And if there is more than one, right, from an Islamic paradigm, um, there would be a power struggle. So like, for example, if one of them destined for you to pass away on a certain day and another one disagreed with you passing on that certain day, one of them would be wrong, right? So categorically speaking, um, I eliminated all religions that uh, preached any form of um, polytheism or any form of like multiple deities or anything like that, right? So after... Uh, looking at the scriptures, the higher category ones, and after reading the Quran, uh, I accept this then probably close to about 12 years ago, something like that. And ever since then, it's been a, um, a very enlightening experience in the sense that um, the things that I was looking for, they were fulfilled. So I was looking for pragmatic guidance. That was fulfilled. I was looking for communication. That was fulfilled. I was looking for the ultimate purpose, like apart from, you know, taking care of yourself, feeding your family, you know, yada, 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 the basics. There was the ultimate purpose, which was to reconnect with that source of creation um, and to be of service to him. And then um, that also quenched my thirst or quenched my thirst for um, uh the consciousness answer, it quenched my thirst for what happens beyond. Um, and naturally, there is a faith component even with Islam. However, what I really appreciated about it, which was different than any other religion, is it encouraged you to go do your due diligence, but um, be sincere in your conduct, and you will get to the truth uh, if you are sincere with yourself, with your own limitations and so on. Now, my ultimate transition is transition from atheism to the acceptance of Islam um, was quite literally after doing all that due diligence, it took me about three years, right? And it's because I kept collecting golden nuggets of things. And then finally, finally, um, when I was ready to let go of my own ego was when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, opened up my heart and opened up my mind to the truth. And now it was just a pushback from Satan of procrastination to take my shahada. So eventually after that, you know, some time, right, included in that three-year period is when I accepted Islam because I realized that I have sufficient uh, knowledge of you know, the things that were satisfying me and that were obviously apparent and if i were to reject it at that point i would just be lying to myself 
you know so oh, that's fascinating. That your question. yeah yeah it did yeah thank you very much what um what scriptures did you look at obviously the bible and yeah i've got i've got you know even i've got my macarthur study bible right here um i took a look a little bit in the vedas i took a look at uh the quran uh naturally when you're when you've got this thick of a bible you have elements of the torah in it right like the old testament um i don't have knowledge of hebrew so it's not like i read the original language but you know translations will do just fine so yeah to just the, the, the Vedas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just very briefly, I found things in there that um, alluded to there being, you know, one deity worthy of worship. But then if you were to open, like, let's say, for example, um, portions of it, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, you had, I mean, categorically to me, I didn't go too far in depth into the Vedas because remember, it violated that category condition of there only being one deity. So that is, that's really what kind of killed it for me. There's nuggets in there. Um, I forget which portion of the Vedas it is. I, it's been so long since I visited it, mm. but it says multiple times over. I mean, even when we did the stream the, on, on Hinduism, the Ramayana, um, there's elements and you can Google it up. There's elements in the Vedas that allude to there being one supreme deity. Oh, definitely. And, that, that's, that's definitely their position. Yeah, there is, uh, you know, they believe in the Brahmin and the idea is that everything kind of connects to him. Um, but what I couldn't get away from was the methodology on how that all connects to him. It didn't make mm -hmm. sense to me, especially the whole idea of like avatars. Yeah, it's to me, it is a um, it's ill befitting for an all powerful creator to have to have like either a portion of himself incarnate in some way. I don't think it's have to, I think it's enjoys doing. Yeah. I, like it's I, a drama. Know, man. I think there's, there's definitely like room for conversation there because I would think that like, when you say enjoys doing like, how would that, how would that play into providing guidance for people? You know what I'm saying? Because what else did he do? He didn't send messengers from the Hindu scriptures. I'm not. I mean, they have rishis, but they're not really prof. They're not, you know. No, know. yeah, they're not prophets. They're not anything like that. It's more like um, God's kind of playing a game of hide and seek with himself uh, yeah. to, en to entertain himself, and you know we're all part of that. <laughs> that's kind would of be the, would be the general. Put, I guess <laughs> you know it's like okay, well. <laughs> You know, to me, that's, I don't know, purposeless, mm. really. But Yeah, per personally, I'm a Buddhist. So um, that's cool. So not far from Hinduism. Um, yeah. Don't have all that kind of, yeah, you know, fluff of the gods and things. But yeah. Yeah, I think that um, one thing that I do appreciate about Buddhism is it really is about, you know, self mastery, I think, as far as like a lifestyle goes, right? Um, y yes, I suppose so. It's, it's about, about controlling the mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, in a lot of ways, it kind of resembles what you were talking about in terms of, you know, you have to have an intellectual uh, rigor to, you know, mm -hmm. you don't just accept what the Buddha said. Mm -hmm. um, the Buddha told us to, to openly, you know, question what he was saying. Don't take it on faith. You know, find out for yourself. If you don't agree with something, you don't agree with it. That's fine. Yeah, there are no tenements of belief in Buddhism. That's what kind of attracted me. Um, how would that, you question it? Like, how would you go about, you know, validating or vetting what what he is saying or is indeed true? Yeah, um, we'd probably go to the very basics, um, which would be the four noble truths. Mm -hmm. So, everything in the world is changing. That's something that you could question. You know that you could validate that for yourself what does remain the same what doesn't what isn't in flux and when you spend a long time kind of questioning that you kind of realize oh actually no there's there's nothing that, that mm -hmm. isn't changing in some way mm -hmm. nothing stays the same 
Mm-hmm. So that that's some that's one element you could say. Well, is that true or is that not true? Mm-hmm. And then you'd look at, you know, the the next sort of claims of the four noble truths would be, you you suffer, and the reason that you suffer, is because you attach yourself to some things that change. Mm-hmm. So you think, well, what is suffering? You know, it's about it's about that kind of contemplation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not it's not about um other. You know the Vedas true. Is there a, is there like a sixth realm of hell and all that kind of thing? It's like no, it's all um, metaphorical, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Anyway, you know I'm even agnostic on reincarnation itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you don't have to be a believer of oh yeah, oh you've been here for eons and eons and eons. Mm-hmm. Um, and from a Buddhist standpoint, I mean you you're believing in reincarnation. Is that the the position, like the Buddhist position? Um, there isn't really a Buddhist position because it's different. Um, mm-hmm. There are no tenements of belief. So you could say, yes, I believe entirely in reincarnation and next next time around I'm going to be a, a beetle or or a dog or something or whatever. You know, that, that, that could be someone's position. That's mm-hmm. certainly not my position. My position on reincarnation would be that each moment you are born again into a new um, a new world, I suppose. You know, from, from from the start of our conversation to now, we are different people. That that would sure. be my position. Sure. Is there? I'm curious. What's the system of accountability like? Like, how would someone reach a reach an end? And an what end. end is that? So, like, let's say, for example, um, you know, you're a really good guy, right? And you you do things that are considered good, right? Uh, how would you be rewarded for doing that good? I think the idea of good, right, and wrong are probably a little bit different. Um, it would be only that there's the concept of karma, but it's not like a cosmic justice machine. Karma is a, is a Sanskrit word. It just means action, it means doing. So it basically means you're doing it. So when you say you have bad karma or good karma, it's like, well, you're you're doing it. So you've only got yourself to blame. Mm-hmm. So let's say somebody was really, really good, like you're a really good guy, right? And if you were to reincarnate, right, just going along with that construct, Mm -hmm. what would your, would your reincarnation be of like a greater status than your current one? Or would it be of a lesser status? Now that can, that can be, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, in that sense, um, there aren't people who are better or worse, Mm -hmm. but there are worse situations to be in the world this isn't my position but the position of these people would be that as a human being you're in the middle position you're you're in you're able to actually escape the wheel of samsara you know you're able to become enlightened because the animals are too stupid the um uh there are people in the hell realms who are are too desirous and then and the gods are too happy so they don't care so that those are the positions, but these are positions of of yourself in your own life. You know when you're in pain, you don't care about anything else apart from the pain. You know if you're being yeah. you being idiotic, you don't care. If you're too happy, you're not bothered. Mm-hmm. So it's about taking the middle position, the middle way. But what's the conclusion? No matter what position you take up, like is the conclusion just an infinite chain of reincarnation and an elevation and De, like an uh, uh, you know a uh, de-escalation of status or what is the what's the end game the end game would be to escape what's called samsara which is the wheel of existence so you'll be hoping to leave this world and enter into nirvana mm-hmm. which which isn't like heaven it's kind of just not being on the wheel but i would i would consider that just to be um you know a, a state of consciousness I see. And that wheel of existence, if you're trying to escape it, are you trying to escape it into a form of non-existence? Almost. But not quite. Why? <laughs> Why? Um, yeah. Well, we go back to the Four Noble Truths. All, all life is suffering in some way. Yeah, but how does... I, I just don't see how, like, you know, what makes life worth it at that point? You know what I'm saying? Like if you're if your whole purpose is to go towards non-existent. Okay, let me ask this then. Let me ask this. So what if somebody was a really, really bad guy? 
are mm-hmm. they what's the opposite of that form of non-existence that they're trying to reach like what's the is there a bad place yeah i'm sure you've seen people who are living in hell that would okay, be my so there is a hellfire then no 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 it, well you're some, saying it's a personal some state of mind say yes. or condition yeah some schools would say yes there is definitely a hellfire it's a real place you'll go there okay. and you'll burn and you'll be tortured and blah 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 right i don't hold that position at all i don't okay. i think it's allegorical i think it's you know it's making statements about how we think how we exist in the world mm-hmm. so you can walk along any you know high street in the city and you can see someone who's you know whacked out on drugs and homeless and they're in hell you can yeah. see that for yourself that that is a type of hell they're there and they're doing it you know they did it to themselves right and then do you sorry just another follow-up question do you have to reincarnate into another human being or can you reincarnate into some other type of you know like an animal in in certain schools of thought again not mine um yes <laughs> okay. yeah, the idea would be that that your karmic actions resulted in a different kind of rebirth whether it would be as an animal or whether it would be as a god or so let me there's i mean there's two questions that i want to ask you and i appreciate you um, humbly explaining this stuff so the first question is let's say i reincarnate into a squirrel Mm -hmm. how would a squirrel do good what determines a squirrel from doing good and bad it's a good question um i don't think that they're karmic action is good or bad because they're too stupid to to do anything other than be a squirrel you know a squirrel's not going to write you a, a book about how you, know, you can be a better squirrel right so are they stuck forever being a squirrel or did the test end now because they're too stupid no i think that's part of like their punishment is that you know you've been stupid so you're going to be a squirrel so and then you have to actually go and do it which how is yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be a squirrel. No, I know, but I'm what I'm saying is like if you really believe that somebody could reincarnate as a squirrel, like what is the test of a squirrel now? Like how is it like to be more squ- I'm not trying to poke fun yeah, at yeah. it. I'm just I'm no, literally no, I'm, I'm, the like, test to be more squirrely. Yeah, the you know test element isn't um the test element would require a tester and a judge. There isn't one. It's so just there is a, no judge. No, it's just a process of being in 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 that you know school of thought isn't the isn't the um the process itself a form of judge because like remember it there is a you could say that yeah yeah because there's a cycle right so you're saying like somebody completes one cycle and then something and you you call it karma being that judge has either issued them to elevate or to you know drop down so I'm wondering, like, you know, just hearing you, the feedback that you're giving me is there's different schools of thought. You're not mm-hmm. quite certain on which school of thought is the correct one. You have chosen one in which you have picked and chosen uh, what best suits your desired outcome. And you're sticking to these four basic principles in which, in turn, you potentially have a chance of being transmuted into something after this particular cycle to the point where there is no clear cut way of getting out. That's what I'm gathering. Not quite. It's slightly different. Okay. In in so much as well, I'm, I'm from the Zen school. Okay. So what, what we practice there is a direct transmission of the Dharma from outside of the scripture, from mind to mind. So that's that's okay. literally just you know a dialectic tradition of talking to people. Okay. Um, and on top of that, we believe in um, Satori, which is um, you know, a sudden enlightenment, a sudden awakening. So, and that, that, that's achievable to anybody at any point in time. Even the squirrel? No, the squirrel's a squirrel. Okay. You can't explain. You can't explain karma and, and the world to a squirrel. Okay. Uh, yeah. So now here's the thing: if you were, uh, because obviously you're a man of intellect and, and a man of reason, right? Mm-hmm. Do you believe what you're upon is reasonable to the point where 
um, you're willing to bet everything on it. Uh, and the caveat is that you are convinced there is nothing better. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restate that again. From what you currently believe, the gamble that you're making is that nothing better exists. No better system exists apart from this karma system uh, and this enlightenment system, in, which includes cycles, which has no, uh, which has a, no clear cut system of accountability and that your judgment is, is left to uh, a process in which you yourself do not understand. Um, and you feel that nothing better exists. As an explanation for the situation we find ourselves in, um, I would say that, yes, at this moment in time, I would definitely say that that it, it's a descriptor of the world as is. Um, because I was saying, you know, part of the Zen tradition is it's direct pointing. So it's mm -hmm. a case of just look for yourself, um, mm -hmm. you know, experience it for yourself. Uh, and that's something that you can do. So that's, again, it's, it's like a fallibility test for for the Quran, you know, you say, oh, it's got these these tests, you know, write a verse like it, et cetera, et cetera. With um, the Zen school in particular, it's a, it's an invitation to look yourself, you know, go have a look for yourself. There's a phrase in Japanese called um, Genshi Genbutsu, which mm -hmm. means go and have a look. <laughs> you know, it, so that that's sort of what meditation is in a way. It's 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 the contemplation of the teachings. It's it's changing your state of mind. Um, the goal of which is, is is a mystical experience that people mm -hmm. call enlightenment. Sure, sure. And uh, the thing is, is how would you determine if that enlightenment is in fact the ultimate reality and is true? Now, I and, and let me kind of preface that a little bit. So the reason why I ask that is because it's your current reality and your current truth, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I think what's happening is when you're doing these types of deeply reflective uh, reflections is that you are basically trusting your intuition because that's all you can work off of. You basically said, go see and do right. And then you're going to gain some type of intu. There's going to be some type of an intuitive thought on your reflections. You're going to say, okay, I feel like I'm headed in the right direction. Right. Yes. Okay. To, to a degree. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, but but it's a great degree. It's not just like a small one. I mean, you're when you're when you're going and having these experiences, right? Which only you can have that experience, which is what's relative to to what's happening to you at the time, mm -hmm. given your age, circumstances, fi including financial health, everything, everything, everything. You're going to have your unique experience, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Someone else who has their own unique experience can come to a completely different conclusion. Yeah. Right. So this is what concerns me. Is well, I, I, no, no, no. I, they, they wouldn't come to a completely different conclusion because we're all looking at the same thing. Well, you might be looking at some the same thing objectively, but what you're telling me is that your subjective intuition is making the decision to proceed forward to take it as as the ultimate reality. That's what's yeah. happening. But the, the, right. the, fra the framework of Buddhism would be a case of look at it this way. It is, it's what we would call right view. Okay. So it'd be a case of this is the framework that you look at it in and it's up to you for when you actually see it. So right. you are looking at an objective world that we all share. And from your subjective position at the moment, you are suffering. You're, you're someone who, yeah, there's lots of things of analogies and things. One of them would be you're walking through a forest and you've been hit by an arrow. Mm-hmm. And instead of going to go and get help and say, oh, gosh, I've got to get this arrow out. It hurts. Mm -hmm. You're looking around going, who shot me? Where, where's, where's the bow? You know, what kind of arrow is this? And people say, well, you've still got an arrow in you. You know, take it out. Mm -hmm. and say, well, and I can't go anywhere until I know what, what, where it's come from. Mm -hmm. that, that's the position of someone who's looking for God. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just take the arrow out. Stop yourself from suffering. It's possible. Um, mm -hmm. What if the what if the arrow were to uh, lead to more harm? Taking it out would lead to more harm. So that's, that's when you suffer harm. twice. So that's another analogy with an arrow, is that you're not only hit once, you're hit twice. 
because mm-hmm. you're hit with the arrow and that hurts that's painful that's natural pain is natural sure. in an enlightened state you, you if you punch a buddha he'll say ow um it, it doesn't work that way so well, so when you are hit with the arrow, you, you, you then say, is it poisoned? You know, mm-hmm. am I going to die? How am I going to get it out? You know, rather than just doing. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, let's explore this. So every single one of us was hit with the arrow that is life, right? Yes. Okay. And we need guidance on what to do with that arrow, which is life, right? Yes. Okay. The difference between Islam and what you're doing is that I'm receiving guidance from the one who created life. And he has told me what to do with that arrow. And I don't have to guess if it's poisonous or not. And what you're doing is you're saying, well, I'm going to explore that arrow and I'm going to bank my own intuitions on what I think is best to whether or not remove it, if it has poison or not. And both of us are looking at the same problem with the, with different time limits that we don't know of, meaning both of us have know that we're facing death, period. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm choosing to follow the guidance of the one that also created death. So all the mechanisms and everything that is within the, the, the construct of life and death i have a guidance for and i don't have to second guess and to me it seems more reasonable to follow that route compared to waiting to figure out based on my own subjective experiences whether or not i have a chance of being right and wrong so i'm taking a path that is more certain rather than one that is just kind of inconclusive. Hmm. It's not worth it to me personally to do what you're doing. Me. And I would inc- I would invite you to that same way, which is Islam, so that way that you have that same guide, which oh, is Maurice, a lot Maurice, God. Maurice, I took the arrow out. No, you're still alive. You didn't know if you took the arrow out or not. The oh, arrow I don't, my... oh, I'm, I'm completely changed now from, from where I was. I don't oh. deny that one bit. I don't deny that one bit. And I don't, I, I think that your, your change and your contributions, your actions contributing to that change. I don't deny any of that. I'm not questioning that, bud. what I'm questioning is, is what's going to happen to you with your, uh, conviction once the life element ceases that's what i'm what i'm questioning and i I think you're upon uncertainty and i think you're upon conjecture which is exactly what the quran says and that's what that's why i'm i'm genuinely wondering why would you put yourself through that i'm not saying that you haven't become a better person from where you were i can't challenge i don't know who you were i can't challenge any of that stuff you know what I'm saying? But I'm saying what you're telling me, right? Multiple schools of thought. You're electing your own path. You have your own experiences, but you're looking at some things objectively through certain principalities. But it's not generally applicable because everybody can pick and choose their own school of thought. And it's just there's no certainty at the end. And the end game is non-existence. Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. That's just that's really tough to swallow, dude. It really is. Yeah, it's difficult, yeah. Yeah, but what's worse about it is not only is it difficult, but it's uncertain. So you are you, you have a, a grander faith that's not based off of any certainty. And I, mm. I'm wondering how you're busting that out with such confidence. Well, there, there are two, two, two roads to Buddhism. One of them is faith, and the other one is reason. So, so you can come to, I didn't come to it through faith. I didn't believe that the Buddha was born out of the side of somebody and, you know, flowers grew from where he walked. That's total nonsense. Mm-hmm. Absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's lovely poetic language, but it's, mm-hmm. it's not the real world. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Buddha was a man who basically said, this is, this is how things are. Go and investigate for yourself. And I'm not, I'm, I'm someone who would have, would have enjoyed having um, a deep faith in an almighty God. You know, I would have enjoyed being a Christian uh, or, or even a, you know, a, 
uh, a Muslim and, and think, yeah, I'm loved by an almighty, omnipotent God. That's great. I just don't believe it. Um, I don't, I've never believed it. Well, in the current position that you're in, you're not loved by him. So that's oh, okay. that, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like wrongdoers or disbelievers. So that's, you know, I, and, and understand that um, I think maybe, you know, you had the pleasure of talking to several Christians through your lifetime, but we don't believe in this like kind of kumbaya, you know, you can do whatever and there, God is all love kind of thing. No, there's there's conditions uh, in order to earn the mercy and the pleasure of God, right? So, like, you can't just be going about doing a bunch of different things that are harmful, not only to yourself, but society as a whole, or violating the conditions that he set forward um, and expecting for him just to be like, oh, you know, it's all good. I love you kind of thing. If that's not the Islamic position, you know? So that's, uh, that's why I, I would say, like, you know, I know you have a copy of the Quran, right? I have several. Yeah, I know. I, I remember you you showing me one, right? And I think <laughs> that, you know, I, I'm not going to challenge whether or not you actually read it in full or not, right? That's oh, I like, read it. Yeah, I read it. Yeah. But I would say if you, I, I would confidently say that I, I don't think you read it sincerely with like an open mind. I, I think did. That, I did for a bit. Okay, that's <laughs> fair. I appreciate your honesty, man. You yeah, know? and then um, yeah, and then I thought no, 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 not for me. And I also read um, uh, Sahih Al Bukhari, and I've read some of the Tafsir as well of Ibn Kathir. Well, I doubt you read Bukhari because not all of it. No, no, I've read a lot yeah, of it. Yeah, it is like it's like nine it's volumes. Isn't it? yeah. <laughs> it's you could you probably need like. 10 lifetimes in your in your terms <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> to get through something like that i mean you know you can get well what, what's interesting about um about the zen school is that they have a, a ceremony every year they keep all their um all the scriptures are either kept in like a box or on a shelf mm -hmm. and every year a monk will come along you know take the scriptures out and go you know like that yeah ah, that's done for the year yeah. that, that's how unimportant they are yeah, and I think that's a fundamental difference because um Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's completely yeah, different. Yeah, man. Like to us, you know, we we don't put the Quran on the ground, we kiss it, like it's it's kind of and it's just a short term of, uh, it's this, a, this is just a translation of, yeah, so respect, about. right? Well, yeah, actually it is, right? And 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 now here's the thing. Um I don't know if it has like a, a parallel Arabic to it in that No, it doesn't. No, no. Oh, okay. No, so just, yeah, just, then it is just a translation. But regardless though. I wouldn't I wouldn't treat it with disrespect anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't think I don't think you're the type I think, um, you know, if you if you understand the reasons why we hold it so uh, kind of sanct is because and sacrosanct is because we know where it came from. And we really th through that process of knowing of where it came from, how it came down and, and so on is with certainty we're upon certainty that it is from that divine source and i know you had said that you cracked it open at one point and you were looking at it sincerely and you're like mm, no that's not for me but here's the thing when you read the quran it'll bounce back the exact psychology as to who you are so if you came across something and i'm genuinely curious as to what you came across that you're like mm, no that's not for me um like what did it did you in where you found that it wasn't relevant because it claims that it's for all of mankind, right? And um, it claims that the message is for you. So I'm curious, like, what part of the message where you were just like, nah, and you shelved it? The first, the first sort of crack in it would have been when um, Muhammad gets an instruction to, says, oh, it's okay that you marry your adopted son's you know, wife after you know you having seen her. I, I kind of thought this sounds a bit like, oh, your personal God, Muhammad, has done everything to help you. And I think Aisha later kind of says the same thing. Okay. Um, that that so, for me was kind of like, oh, oh, it is just Muhammad. Yeah. 
Okay. So if you can give me a reference to that. Oh, I, I could not be able to give you a reference. Or anything. No worries. You don't have to do it today. But I think yeah. what you're doing is you're confusing. Like you said, Aisha says something like that. There's no. Oh, Aisha reference. isn't in the Quran. I know that. Okay. She, she's in. The, yeah. But it. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's in Sahih Muslim where she says, I don't know. Um, right. So if you're if you're talking about Zaid, right, mm -hmm. the adopted son. So the reason being is because there was a, a habit that was being built saying that uh, Zaid is now the son of the prophet. Ali OK, and I want you just to think from an outsider's point of view, which is very, very easy, right? In Islam, when somebody is an adopted son, they are not a blood relative to you, okay? So if there was a divorce that happened with a non-blood relative, I don't see how you can find fault in a marriage happening not for the purposes of the primitive mind jumping to the conclusion of primitive thoughts, but rather for the for a, a different purpose, such as like the preservation or the protection of what once was. Do you understand? Preservation so, of what once was, what do you mean? Yeah, so I mean, let's say, for example, if it's a preservation of tribal structure, OK, because you have to take a look at the marriages of the prophet, peace be upon him. Many of the people were his elder. Mm -hmm. Okay, Many of the, the women that he married were his senior. And many of them were widowed or in a state of need. Right. So it's not just these primitive desires that are going forth. You have to explore something like that in depth to figure out exactly why something like that was per permitted. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand the apologetic. Um, no, 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 I, not I, the I, apologetic. I did, I did it's not an apologetic. It's the reality of what was Oh, oh sorry, sorry, sorry by, by apologetic, I mean defense of scripture. No, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I'm saying that you have to be respective of what's happening at the time, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and I, then, I do get that. I understand that. Um, like yeah. in terms of one of the major criticisms that people often have is, you know, the age of Aisha. And I think, well, yeah, at, at, at the time, that would have been less egregious, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and we would be committing, like, as you say, some kind of logical fallacy of presentism. Yeah. But even so, if you look at the psychology of what was going on with him, the Prophet, if he was in any way, shape or form deranged, or if he was interested in younger women to that capacity, where most men jump to have those primitive thoughts, why did he wait three years for consummation? Didn't he have to wait for Abu Bakr's payment or something? No. No. As a matter of fact, Aisha was scheduled to be married before the Prophet. There was someone else. And then she fit the criteria and the conditions of marriage uh, and now they had to wait for the criteria of consummation. So it shows you a step-by-step -step process. If somebody was sick in the head, you know, I would that he would have gone and and done it, you know, quickly. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. You know what I'm saying? There's just no. There seem to be occasions where he doesn't seem to have managed to maintain his desires for women. Um, what do you mean? Well, he sees a woman and then has to go and have sex with his wife immediately at some point, doesn't he? No, where are you getting that from? See, here's the thing, man. Like, you're, I, and I think what's happening is that and this is why I say you didn't look at Islam sincerely, is because you're looking at outside sources that are critiquing that have minimal to no, not, not even minimal, extremely, extremely small amounts of knowledge on the subject.